Welcome to Decoded, providing in-depth insight into cybersecurity. Is using the cloud possible to do securely? Is anyone actually testing cloud security, or are we relying just on empty marketing claims? And how do you trade and handle cryptocurrency safely and avoid the hackers and scams? We answer all of these questions and more with special guests Eugene Kaspersky from Kaspersky, Luis Carones from Avast, and Chad Skipper from VMware. Show notes, including any links mentioned in the show, are available at decodedcyber.com. The cloud is an integral part of our lives today, whether we just use a basic smartphone to send text messages or store all of our files using a service like Dropbox, iCloud or Google Drive. Our email, bank accounts, social media, virtual lives, pretty much everything we see on a screen is on the internet and therefore in the cloud. When we talk about the cloud, we usually think of files being stored somewhere. Bank accounts have always been outside of our direct control. That's their point. It's somewhere safer than our homes that we can use to store our money. But access to our accounts has changed. When once you had to enter a building and sign pieces of paper, now you can manage your money from any location on the planet, potentially so could somebody else. But files, your email and other messages, your photos and important documents, they're most likely to be stored online these days. It's really hard to avoid it if you use a smartphone, and PCs and Macs, well, they push users to use things like OneDrive and iCloud. If you have a Gmail account, you also have large amounts of free Google Drive storage. Smartphones often upload your photos automatically, so you can access them using other devices and you won't lose them along with your phone should the unthinkable happen. The cloud is only going to become more important, helping or intruding into our lives depending on your perspective. Smart devices will become ever more present, learning from us and trying to streamline our lives. Eugene Kaspersky, founder of security company Kaspersky, can see a time where the cloud is even going to get you up in the morning and into the office, possibly with a coffee in your hand. But can we trust the cloud to be secure enough to run our lives? So in the future, we'll have dozens of the smart devices. You'll have a smart uh, coffee machine, uh, fridge, uh, vacuum cleaner, which are connected to the internet. And technically speaking, they will be vulnerable. If you build them uh, on the traditional operating systems, uh, they will be vulnerable. Uh, And uh, there is a risk that one day uh, your smart house is uh, badly hacked. So, well, of course we can develop antivirus for fridge, for vacuum cleaner, but who is going to install and manage all that? Yeah, that, yes. that, that, that's a problem. You need a, fi- a firewall on your Dyson. <laughs> so this is a problem. Uh, so I don't see the, the future world, which is uh, um, hyper-connected, uh, which uh, dozens of smart devices around us. Uh, and it will happen. So they will navigate our life. They will help us. Uh, so the coffee machine and fridge, they will report the cloud when you're waking up. And the cloud... Uh, knowing your typical behavior, uh, will send you the autonomous car uh, without your request. Because the cloud knows that typically uh, half an hour after waking up, you go to the office. Uh, And actually, the the smart navigator in the cloud will balance the traffic in the city. So there will be much less traffic jam, uh, etc., etc., etc. So the world will be not just hyper-connected like now, but even more will be in completely in a cyber world. Uh, and it's true about individual life, it's true about your office life, and it will be true about industrial systems and infrastructure. And everything is vulnerable if it's built on a traditional operating system. So every piece of the future world will need cyber security. And this is impossible. It's impossible to manage, it's impossible to update, upgrade, uh, and so it's too complicated. So the only way I believe that the only strategy, the true strategy is to design the systems on the immune architecture to make them secure by design. Yeah. Do you know, I mean, it sounds quite science fiction, but it isn't. And it makes me think even just 10, 15 years ago, um, if you were to hack a network, 
um, networked printers are basically Linux servers um, and bad guys can hack into printers and they can hide their tools there. Um, so it's just one step from there to doing the same with a fridge or a vacuum cleaner. Uh, well, actually, it's not a science fiction. Uh, the first vulnerable fridge, as far as I remember, was found in 2007. <laughs> I remember I had in my presentation that that time in my presentation uh, I had uh, the uh, slides with a fridge which is vulnerable, uh, which coffee machine connected to the internet and vulnerable. Uh, but there was kind of exception. There was just a very new devices. Uh, and uh, well, well, but now it's getting much more, much more cyber. And uh, I believe that in the future you'll not be able to find and buy coffee machine which is not connected to the internet. It will be a standard. When we talk about um, Internet of Things and funny devices like fridges or or toasters, to many people who don't understand how computers work, it sounds far fetched. It sounds funny and kind of silly, but Generally, all of these devices are Linux-based computers, aren't they? Yes, that, that's right. So the embedded systems, they are mostly Linux-based. Uh, that's absolutely right. And we, we've, we've been knowing how to hack Linux systems for uh, decades. So there really isn't any big difference for a hacker to hack a fridge than a web server. Um, I guess it's almost no difference, and maybe even it's much less uh, complicated to hack it mm. uh, simply because the uh, Microsoft Windows uh, and uh, Mac operating systems they were hacked many times so these vendors they have the experience with a hacker's attack but uh, what about the fridge vendors? <laughs> the fridge vendors are probably using default passwords in many cases. Exactly like that already happened with the CCTV cameras uh, you, of course you are aware about the Mirai botnet would you like to explain a bit about that? That would be that that could be useful for people to hear. Uh, so there, I think that the world's biggest uh, cyber attack uh, with uh, uh, unknown number of infected uh, devices uh, and which still alive for three or four years after it was found, it's a CCTV-based. Uh, malware which infected uh, the video cameras, the security cameras. Uh, so the malware was uh, developed in a very smart way and it used different ways how to infect, how to find and infect other devices. Uh, it used the default passwords which some of vendors use and known vulnerabilities uh, in the code of uh, different uh, cameras. Unfortunately, it was uh, very, very successful uh, malware. And once again, it's not uh, computers. It's not Microsoft Windows or Mac. It's not uh, smartphones. That's the uh, Internet of Things. That's uh, CCTV cameras. Uh, and well, actually, that was a huge, that was a huge problem uh, with a DDoS attack, which was run by this uh, botnet, botnet uh, infected by Mirai uh, world. So a DDoS, a distributed denial of service. So all of these systems that were on the internet under the control of bad guys are doing their normal job on a daily basis. But when they're needed, they send lots of rubbish um, information across the internet to take down other websites or other systems. Yeah, exactly. It feels a bit bleak, doesn't it? We have all of these internet services out there hoping to integrate with our lives but they're vulnerable to attack and quite possibly may just crash due to bugs and other issues. Securing the cloud is important, whether you're a home user or run a large organisation. Can it be done when you don't have complete control over the services that you want to use? And what about testing? If you want to know how secure Microsoft Office 365 is or Apple iCloud, are there any serious reviews that you can read? At SE Labs, we test cloud services as well as software and hardware products that you can actually see and touch. But cloud security has significant challenges, one of which is quite surprising. Brian Monkman from Security Testing Standards Organization, NetSec Open, joins us. Brian, what challenges do testers face with cloud security firewalls and other similar products? A lot of the major, almost all of the major cloud providers out there um, have uh, uh, use usage agreements that in any way that tend to embargo 
this kind of testing. No, so they just don't want to be tested. <laughs> well, they 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 don't. It's it's it that, but they also want to have a significant amount of control over what their what the uh, network is required to handle. You know, because they they they're subjected to many service level agreements, and they want they don't want to open themselves up to financial risk by allowing testing. Mm-hmm. So um, that that's a significant issue, right? So if we're testing a firewall box on our own network, we're not going to bring down anything that Cisco or Palo Alto is running. But Correct. if we're dealing directly with a, a cloud service provider, we are touching their servers directly and using up their bandwidth. Right. Right, so controls have to be put in place to ensure that that thing cannot happen. Uh, another another thing to take into consideration, performance metrics such such as you know connections per second or throughput can very easily been be dealt with in a cloud environment just by throwing more instances um, of you know of the firewall at at the issue. So you know. Something like latency, which isn't as much of an issue in in a traditional networking environment, becomes a significant issue in the cloud environment. But other things like um, throughput and connections per second become less of an issue. I can also imagine that um, some testers will have better internet connectivity than others. And so it might not right. be fair for a small lab in rural England to um, to do a cloud-based test to one uh, versus one that's connected in, I don't know, Silicon Valley, like next door to one of the major data centers. True that, but at at the same time, that's a a relatively simple issue to um to overcome in this day of co location, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 so on. It's it's a little bit more technically complex, but you know, you somebody is in using your example in rural England doesn't necessarily need to be on premises, you know, to be able to execute uh, testing from a lab. No, they could set up um, a co-located ser- server in rural China and probably get some of the best broadband available. Well put. <laughs> <laughs> Trusting the cloud to be secure isn't something that sits well with many of us. There isn't much in the way of third-party oversight and mistakes can happen. It's not as if the platforms like Google and Apple have flawless systems. There have been cases in recent years where Google has accidentally shared private files and even closed accounts because they've incorrectly identified illegal content. Apple has collected audio recordings from users without permission, and these are the recent cases that we know about. You can go back quite some time to a story that stuck in my head over the years. In 2012, Journalist Matt Honan watched as his Google account was deleted. His Twitter account was taken over and used to send offensive and illegal messages. And his Apple devices, his laptop, phone and iPad, well, they slowly started to erase themselves in front of his eyes. It's a horrendous cautionary tale that will turn you onto two-factor authentication and backups if nothing else has until now. We've linked to Matt's article on Wired in the show notes, and it's very much worth reading if only to see what a catastrophic personal hack looks like through a survivor's eyes. And this hack was partially the fault of Apple. They hadn't managed their customer service system properly, and hackers were able to use social engineering to do part of the attack. Matt lost photos of his child from her first days. Unique documents also disappeared forever, But as far as we know, no money was lost. Many people invest in cryptocurrency and lose money because of the random nature of how cryptocurrency is valued. But others can lose it when they're hacked. Given the issues with cloud security and even just endpoint security, the security that we put onto our laptops, is it possible to safeguard cryptocurrency assets? Luis Carones from security firm Avast joins us. When we think about banking, um, we often think about physical banking, walking into a branch, maybe with a checkbook or a, a banking book. And over the last 10, 15, 20 years, things have really changed dramatically. Um, and banking is essentially a cloud service. And so now our money's in the cloud as well as our emails. Obviously, there are various threats that we face today that we didn't used to. And cryptocurrency is a particularly interesting one because 
not only is it in the cloud, it's on internet servers that you don't control, um, but it's not even necessarily recognized by some people as real money. It's not regulated in the same way that banks are regulated. And so there's not the same protection. How would someone go about investing and trading and, and using cryptocurrency safely in today's world? Yeah, yeah, especially when everything is digital. And, and we used to say that there is nothing 100% safe, right? So how do you handle if you have like your life savings in cryptocurrency? How do you keep that safe? I mean, that's on the cloud. Uh, yeah. How, how can you secure that? Is there even a way to do that? And as you were saying, unlike traditional banking, there is no kind of um, uh, thing to keep you safe. Like to, if someone goes to your bank account nowadays and they take your money out of your account, uh, you can go to the police, you can go to the bank, and you will probably get your money back with Cryptocurrency, this doesn't happen, right? I mean, if you lose your Bitcoins, Ethereum, wherever you're using, you lose them for good. You won't get them back. Uh, so what can we do? What, what are the different options we have here? So um, there are many ways to work with cryptocurrency. I, am, um, I guess that for the normal regular user, uh, the first thing you have to think about is, okay, where do I keep my wallet? What's um, what's a cryptocurrency wallet? Is it a physical thing? Is it a, a file? Uh, well, it's wh where you keep your your private key. So one thing we uh, many people may be confused is when you're talking about a wallet, it's like, okay, well, what is a wallet? It's where I put my money, right? So that means that if I buy Bitcoins and I put them in this wallet, uh, then I can take my wallet with me and I, the cryptocurrency is with me, the Bitcoin in this case. But that, that's not the case, right? I mean, the, the, the Bitcoins are kept in the cloud. So this, the wallet is a way for you to claim your Bitcoin or whatever at some point in the future? Yeah, I mean, to, to do whatever you want to do with them, uh, to, uh, to, uh, you, you need this private key, right? So where do you save it? You need to have it like somewhere safe and you only have to use it when uh, you are going to do some kind of transaction, right? So there are different options to do that. There are even services in the cloud that um, allow you to manage this, which is something you can do, but uh, you are not in control of your own case. So that's something I would never do, right? Then, okay, you can have a digital wallet. Um, that can be a software wallet that you can have in your computer or in your phone. Just on your Windows PC, you could have this text file or whatever it is. Yeah, I know. Or you can have it in your phone or wherever you want, like, right? Or even uh, in, in any device you use. Or uh, there is another option, which is a hardware wallet, right? Which is like a separate device. Imagine a USB stick, right? Where you put your, your key there. And... That will be like the most secure option probably nowadays. What's the problem with a um, digital wallet? Well, uh, it's in your computer, in your phone, in whatever you, device you have, which means that it's uh, most of the time online. If you get hacked, your computer or your phone gets compromised, there is a chance that someone can get to your digital wallet and take the information out of it, right? With a hardware wallet, uh, one of the first protections you have is that you don't you don't have it online. You only use it when you plug it into your device. In that moment, that's when it is online and it will be susceptible, let's say, to hacking. But even then, it has like several other layers of protection. Even if I don't know, let's say that you have it with you and you lose it, right? So and someone gets to it. Okay, then they could uh, try to get access to your private key. But uh, most of these hardware wallets, they have some protections. Like, for example, you need to set a, a PIN code. Mm. And you can enter that PIN code. And you cannot actually do a brute force attacking against it. Because if you type it wrong a number of times, then it will delete the information. So the private, uh, uh, your private key will be deleted. 
So can you you can have uh, backup hardware keys, can you? You could maybe hide one somewhere else. So if if someone steals your main one and they they delete it by getting your pin wrong a number of times, you haven't just lost your fortune. Yeah, no, you you not. But you don't need to have more than one. I mean, like because uh, when when you're setting up your your wallets, uh, there is one option that you get that is uh, uh, setting your a uh, seed phrase. With this seed phrase, you could uh, eventually recover your private key. Where's the where's the private key stored then? Uh, so no, the private key is stored in the hardware wallet. But then uh, you can have a seed phrase which you should keep really safe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a set of words between twelve and twenty four words, right? Uh, so you can put this like in your house in somewhere really safe or even at the bank. If you are like having like a lot of money and you want to to keep it safe, you can have have it in 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 a deposit box or something in the, in your bank. If something terrible happens, if there is like some kind of I don't know, you lose uh, your key, doesn't work anymore, or whatever. You simply seed phrase, you get uh, you get access back to your to to your private key, and you can you get access to all your assets. Mm -hmm. So where do you use this seed phrase? Um, is it is this all part of the Bitcoin blockchain, or how, how does it work? Yeah, I mean, this is an option that you are given uh, when you create your your wallet at the first time, right? Like you are creating a new wallet, you are given this this option. Uh, uh, with with the um, hardware wallets, some of them even uh, they have software. Uh, included that help you to through this process, which is kind of easy. I mean, it's like it's just uh, words, usually in English. But even if your language is not English, some there are some software solutions that give you words in another language. It's an easier way to manage your private key, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I guess very worst case scenario, if if people are don't see the risk and they don't want to spend the money, they could put their secret key just on a USB flash drive and hide it somewhere. Uh, very secret. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in any case, uh, what I mean, if you get, if you have like really a, a good amount of money in cryptocurrency, what I would do, I will have like this um, hardware wallet uh, store and that uh, with the seed phrase also hidden somewhere else, and then you can have a digital wallet. You know, you have, you can there. You can have there some pocket chains if you want mm -hmm. to play with cryptos or uh, buy stuff or whatever you want to do with that. You, you, you don't need to have all your money in the same wallet, right? So you can have a, a digital wallet that sometimes might be more convenient than the hardware one to keep your pocket chains and the real, uh, your real savings can be in safe using this hardware wallet. The seed phrase idea, that could be quite exciting. You could do something a bit Dan Brown, a bit... Um thrillery and sort of find your favorite book and underline each of the words in turn in that book to remember what your seed phrase is yeah but uh, you're not picking your seed phrase oh sure but you just have to go through the book and find the words in sequence no yeah oh yeah i, I know what you mean no i thought yeah i mean like the seed phrase is given to you right yes it, yes yeah okay so yeah you could do some like da vinci code kind of thing yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> to protect your fifty pounds worth of cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah, and then you better remind how <laughs> how to solve the puzzle, right? <laughs> Would it be at all reasonable to get, I don't know, a very cheap laptop, um, a Chromebook, something like that, and use that just for doing your cryptocurrency uh, transactions? Oh, uh, it's possible. It's doable. It's a bit more expensive than a hardware wallet. And I would still be using a hardware wallet anyway, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, unless, I don't know, you have a truly massive amount of money, right, in cryptocurrencies. And uh, you have, like, reasons beyond normal to protect your privacy. You want to get it to the extreme, right? Or maybe you are tax evading or something i don't know <laughs> but you really want to keep your privacy there that yeah it's it's a bit of an overkill for the normal user but yeah definitely i mean like getting a cheap laptop uh even with a sim card uh so you only use that device for that purpose mm -hmm. yeah that's uh perfectly perfectly fine 
but you think that's um that's a bit too over the top for your, your average cryptocurrency user yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I never do it for example and i and most users i won't even bother because it's not that you are adding so much uh protection on top of and it's you're adding more layers of complexity for the normal user is there, um, if you're using a hardware wallet, is there still a threat from malware? So if you plug this thing into your Windows laptop and there's already, a hacker's already got access to it, can they somehow get into your hardware wallet? Uh, so far, they are pretty safe, but uh, <laughs> it's just a matter of time. Uh, the, the good thing is that there is not like a standard, right, on hardware wallets. So... It's not like writing a malware. I mean, it's it's a, you need to write a malware, finding a user who is using cryptocurrency in a specific type of hardware wallet, and then try to figure out a way to to circumvent the security uh, features that these hardware wallets have. That they it's a number of them, so it's not just still. I mean, uh, nothing is unhackable. Right. Sure. I'm just thinking about hacking team when they were hacked uh, some years ago. <laughs> um, and I look through the WikiLeaks data and you could see that the guy that had been hacked on his laptop or desktop PC, we don't know which, um, he'd been using TrueCrypt, I think it was. It was some kind of hard disk encryption mm -hmm. anyway. And because he was logged in, uh, when the hacker had control of his system, um, he could just wait for this guy to unlock his TrueCrypt volumes and then find all of those text files with his passwords. On yeah. Them. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, if your computer is compromised and uh, someone has access to your computer, he could eventually do whatever you are doing in your computer. Right. So as soon as you uh, put your hardware wallet in your computer and you start doing things, he could be doing the same, right? Yes. So he could eventually get uh, that information out of there. But I think that's a really important point is that the hardware wallet itself, it's once it's plugged into a computer, some of its protection has kind of gone, hasn't it? Yeah, well, uh, as long as anything is aligned, yeah, even if you have a lot of protection, yeah, um, it's open for strangers to try to break that protection. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons I quite like the idea of a Chromebook is because malware doesn't really work on Chromebooks or, or iPads, I guess, as well. Um, so that's one way that you could mitigate the threat is to use a, a, a mobile-style product. Because um, as you know, anti-malware works quite differently on mobile, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, no, and, and not, not just that. I mean, even oh, if you go to that uh, through that road, like, yeah, I mean, even if you have like, a, as we were saying earlier, uh, not just a device like an iPad or something, but even the, the connection you're using, uh, if it can be like completely different to the one, because you can say, okay, I'm using a wherever, a Chromebook or an iPad, and then I'm connecting through a network. What if that network is compromised? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so... That doesn't mean that, okay, oh, my network is compromised, so someone is going to be able to steal whatever. No, but yes, <laughs> at the end of the day. I mean, if uh, your router is compromised, uh, everything you do on the network can be compromised. And now, just before we finish, it's security life hack time. At the end of each episode, we give a special security tip that works for real people in the real world, for work and in personal lives. Chad Skipper has worked in many major security companies over the years, from Symantec, Cisco, Silence, and now VMware. And here he is with his security life hack. Hey, this is Chad Skipper with your security life hack. You know, you've heard use antivirus, and everybody should use antivirus, but it's not just any antivirus. Some are great, some are not. Even when you go Google for antivirus, you need to actually look for the reviews from respected testers. And any AAA rated by SE Labs is a good bet and a good starter point. Just remember that the price doesn't always indicate quality. Please subscribe. And if you enjoyed this episode, please send a link to just one of your close colleagues. It would really help us out. And we also have a free email newsletter. Sign up on our website where you'll also find this episode's show notes and bonus episodes featuring full-length interviews with our guests. Just visit decoded.com.
cyber.com. And that's it. Thank you for listening, and we hope to see you again soon.